Greenpeace underestimated the rise of solar. One of the world's largest environmental advocacy groups released an optimistic industry analysis called the Energy Revolution in 2010. It was far more ambitious than any government predictions. And it still got it wrong. Greenpeace estimated that by 2020, the world would have 335,000 megawatts of installed solar photovoltaic capacity. That's enough to power almost 64 million U.S. homes and an increase of over 700 percent from 2010. But by the end of 2018, there were already over 480,000 megawatts installed globally, enough to power about 91 million homes. Elon Musk promised the world Tesla solar roof tiles in 2016, something the company has yet to fully deliver on. But it turns out the solar industry may not need the upgrade. While the aesthetic of solar tiles that look indistinguishable from normal roofing material is alluring, the industry has been growing exponentially thanks to plain old solar panels. You can see the evidence both on people's rooftops and in the desert, where utility-scale solar plants are increasingly popping up. Here in the U.S., of all new power capacity added to the grid in 2018, about 30% of that was from solar. Global capacity of solar cells has increased year on year for the past decade fueled by the plummeting prices and rising efficiency of solar cells, forcing fossil fuel producers out of the market through technological advance. At the end of 2019, the total installed capacity of photovoltaic cells exceeded 630,000 megawatts, an astounding figure that is going to continue to rise in the coming decades. However, in the 40 years we've been using solar cells, there has been a mystery flaw that has been sapping away potential electricity from the photovoltaic cells. Upon testing in the laboratory, newly manufactured solar cells display an efficiency of about 20%, meaning they can convert 20% of the incoming energy from sunlight into electric current. However, within hours of operation, that efficiency would drop to 18% a 10% drop in total electric generation. Losing 10% of 630,000 megawatts of power is no small problem. That's equivalent to about 30 nuclear power plants worth of power capacity. If the solar panels could operate all day, which they can't. But you get the point. There's a lot of potential electricity being lost. It's no wonder that scientists and engineers have been hunting down the cause of this problem termed light-induced degradation for 40 years. And last year, we may have finally cracked the problem and found the cause behind this mysterious loss in power. To understand it, we first have to understand how photovoltaic cells work. Photovoltaic cells use the photovoltaic effect to generate a current, an effect where photons of a particular threshold frequency striking a material can cause electrons to gain enough energy to free them from their atomic orbits and move freely in the material. This is best achieved with semiconductors, whose unique properties lying between conductors and insulators allows them to most easily elevate electrons from atomic orbit to moving freely among their atoms. Some of the first solar cells were created with selenium, like this one, created by Charles Fritz sitting atop a New York roof in 1884 a revolutionary device that produced a consistent current of electricity, but it was achieving an efficiency of just 1%, converting 1% of the energy striking it in the form of light into electricity. This, in combination with the high cost of selenium, made it an unviable source of electricity. To succeed, these devices needed to compete with fossil fuel power sources. Before the photovoltaic effect could power the world, scientists and engineers would need to figure out how to increase that efficiency percentage and to do it with cheaper materials. Enter silicon, a common semiconductor material that has formed the bedrock of the electronic age. This is going to be our starting material for our solar cell. Let's build a solar cell from scratch and see how efficiencies were gradually increased over time. Let's first look at what happens when light interacts with a pure silicon crystal like this. Incoming light can do one of three things. It can be reflected, absorbed, or simply pass right through it. If light is reflected or passes through, it cannot produce the photovoltaic effect. Step one to improving our efficiency is to minimize the amount of light 
that gets reflected off the material. This is wasted energy that affects our efficiency level. In fact, 30% of light that strikes untreated silicon is reflected. So before we even start, our maximum efficiency drops to 70%. For this reason, silicon is often treated with a layer of silicon monoxide which can reduce the light reflected to just 10% while a second layer with a secondary material like titanium dioxide can reduce it as low as 3%. Texturing the surface of the material can further increase the probability of light being absorbed. If it is textured like this, light that is initially reflected has another chance to strike the material and be absorbed. Only light that is absorbed can potentially cause the photovoltaic effect, but not all light will. We need photons above a threshold energy to increase an electron's energy enough to allow it to move freely in the material. A photon's energy is defined by multiplying Planck's constant by its frequency. Silicon requires photons with 1.1 electron volts to produce the photovoltaic effect, which corresponds to a wavelength of 1110 nanometers. This lies around here in the light spectrum, and any lower energy from here down cannot produce the photovoltaic effect. This light will simply cause the atom to vibrate and create heat. This graph shows the total solar energy being emitted by the sun. However, a good deal of this does not reach the Earth's surface as it is absorbed by the atmosphere. This is a more realistic graph. About 4% of the energy reaching Earth's surface is in ultraviolet, as the sun emits relatively little ultraviolet photons. 44% is in the visible spectrum, and 52% is in the infrared spectrum. This may sound surprising, as infrared is lower energy, but it covers a wider range of the spectrum, and thus accounts for more energy. Because silicon cannot make use of light with a wavelength greater than 1110 nanometers, everything from here up is energy we cannot convert into electricity. This represents about 19% of the total energy reaching Earth. Another thing to note is that light with higher energy does not release more electrons. It simply produces higher energy electrons. Blue light has roughly twice the energy of red light, but the electrons that blue light releases simply lose their extra energy in the form of heat, producing no extra electricity. This energy loss results in about 33% of sunlight's energy being lost. So, these spectrum losses alone cause a 52% loss in efficiency. This is a lot of energy to lose, but silicon sits near the ideal threshold frequency that balances these two energy losses, capturing enough of the lower energy wavelengths while not losing too much efficiency as the result of the material heating up. This is such a large loss in power that in some climates, active cooling which takes some of the electricity the panels create to cool the panels, actually results in more electricity being generated. The reason solar panels lose efficiency as they get hotter is quite complicated, but for now, all you need to know is that silicon balances these factors best for terrestrial purposes. On to the next problem. Knocking an electron free by itself does not create an electrical current in our circuit. It just frees an electron to move freely about the material. To create a useful current, we have to force this electron around an external circuit where it can do work. Freeing an electron also creates a positively charged hole in its place that is also free to move about the material. If an electron meets a hole, it simply fills it and our energy is wasted. The next trick to maximize efficiency is to limit the chances electrons have to fill these holes and to force them into our circuit as quickly as possible. To do this, we use the unique properties of silicon. Silicon has four electrons in its outer shell, and thus readily forms a crystal structure with four neighboring atoms using covalent bonds, a bond where neighboring atoms share an electron pair. We can manipulate this behavior and tailor the crystal's material properties by adding impurities called dopants. Say we add boron atoms to the silicon crystal wafer. These boron atoms have three electrons available for bonding with the silicon crystal, but silicon wants four. So this creates a hole in the crystal that wants to be filled with an electron. We call this a P-type as it has positive charge carriers. 
Now, let's say we create another wafer of silicon, but this time we add atoms with five electrons available for bonding, like phosphorus. Again, the phosphorus bonds with the silicon, but this time we have an extra electron that can float freely about the material. We call this an n-type because it has negative charge carriers. Now, let's sandwich these two materials together and see what happens. The positive holes and negative electrons migrate towards each other. The electrons will jump into the p-type and the holes jump into the n-type. This causes an imbalance of charge because now the p-type has more negative charges and the n-type has more positive charges. We have just formed an electromagnetic valve that allows electrons to pass in one direction. Let's see how this works. Suppose a photon with sufficient energy enters the p-type side of the solar cell and knocks an electron free. The electron starts bouncing around the material and one of two things can happen. It can recombine with a hole, resulting in no current, or it can come into the electromagnetic field at the junction of the materials. Here, the electromagnetic field actually accelerates the electron across the junction into the n-type side, where there are very few holes for it to fill, and to boot, the junction's electromagnetic field actually prevents the electron from passing back to the other side. A similar thing happens on the n-type side, where holes are selectively transported across the junction before they can recombine. This means one side of the junction becomes negatively charged, while the other side becomes positively charged. We have created a potential difference, or in other words, a voltage. If we add some metal contacts and an external load circuit, these electrons will pass along the circuit to recombine with the holes on the other side. We have just created a solar cell. You may notice a problem here though. By adding metal contacts to the upper surface of the solar cell, we have just blocked light from entering the cell and thus reduced its efficiency. This is yet another problem engineers have had to think carefully about in their quest to optimize solar cell efficiency. Over the years, engineers have optimized both the shape and manufacturing techniques to minimize the area covered by the metal electrodes, while also minimizing the resistance the electrons will face in entering the external circuit. One research paper used topology optimization to design these electric contacts. Topology optimization uses algorithms to optimize the design of objects using constraints the engineer inputs. Using this method for the electric contacts produce something remarkably like the vasculature of a leaf. That shouldn't really surprise you. Vasculature on a leaf does not perform photosynthesis. It instead brings the water that is essential for photosynthesis to the leaf and extracts the useful products, serving a similar purpose as our electric currents. So, of course, plants have developed the perfect shape to optimize the energy they can absorb from the sun. Plants have had millions of years to evolve this shape. However, most solar cells use a simple grid shape, as it is cheaper to manufacture. This typically results in an efficiency loss of about 8%. All told, these effects result in a typical modern solar cell having a laboratory tested efficiency of 20%. So, what was happening to cause that drop to 18% after a couple of hours of operation? This problem was the focus of hundreds of scientific papers, and many found clues to the problem. Many noted that the efficiency drop was correlated to the concentration of boron and oxygen in the silicon, and noted that the drop did not occur when boron was substituted with gallium. Thus, it was known a boron-oxygen defect was causing the issue. Others found that the defects could be reversed by heating the silicon in the dark at 200 degrees for 30 minutes, but it would return once again upon exposure to the light. Efforts in reducing the problem have primarily focused on reducing the concentration of oxygen impurities in the silicon wafers, which occur as a result of the silicon manufacturing technique that is the source of 95% of silicon solar cells. These manufacturing techniques are still a point of research, and the engineers and scientists were working blindly. Little was known about the actual defect creation process and how exactly it was causing such a large drop in efficiencies leaving engineers with less information to solve the problem with. This paper used a special imaging technique 
and observed these boron oxygen molecules converting into something the paper refers to as shallow acceptors when exposed to light. In essence, they observed the defects transforming into little electron traps that acted as recombination sites and thus reduced the time and probability of electrons entering the circuit to do work. With this knowledge, engineers can now develop better techniques for preventing this phenomenon and hopefully increase our renewable energy capacity in the coming years. And states like California are leading the way with bold solar targets, incentives, and regulations. Every new home built in California after the new year must generate as much energy as it consumes. So presumably by making the homes very efficient and installing solar. But the picture is not all rosy. Solar power is intermittent. The sun isn't always shining, and the price of storage solutions like lithium ion batteries is still relatively high. Installing solar can be a large upfront cost, and permitting can slow the whole process down. These are real problems that the industry needs to tackle if solar is going to reach its potential. But if the recent past is any indication, solar power is going to help lead the transition to a carbon-free future, and it might do it faster than we all expected. In 2018, solar power made up around 2.3% of electricity generation here in the U.S. That number may seem small, but it's an impressive leap from 2008, when solar comprised a mere 0.1% of our electricity. Across the country, in utility after utility, what's become fringe is the idea that you might do, build another coal plant, right? No one is really doing that today. The surge in solar installations has been driven by a steep decrease in the price of photovoltaics, the technology that powers solar panels for both residential and utility-scale use. Since the 1970s, costs have dropped tremendously. Back then, solar on the ground was about $5 a watt, so 50 cents or more per kilowatt hour. And solar is down now today in the best large commercial applications at one to two cents. So a factor of 50 reduction. And on rooftop systems, if you finance it right and you're in a good location, your effective cost can be under 10 cents. It does still cost a lot to get solar. According to Energy Sage, an online solar financing marketplace, the average rooftop panel system in the US cost about $12,500 after tax credits in 2019. But after about seven to eight years of lower electricity bills, customers typically break even and start seeing significant savings. And to defray the upfront cost, customers can often get a solar loan or choose to lease the panels instead. Overall, the massive price drop for photovoltaics is largely thanks to China's massively subsidized solar power manufacturing program, which created a worldwide glut in solar panels in the late 2000s. Prices plummeted, and solar companies around the world had to find ways to slash costs to stay afloat. Lots of companies went under, but enough innovated and survived such that in many parts of the country today, solar can now compete on economics alone. So solar went from essentially the most expensive form to one of the cheapest. It may be affordable, but it's not perfect. Solar panels don't generate any power during the nighttime, and they're much less effective in cloudy or shady environments. And while the price of photovoltaic panels has dropped, the cost of energy storage options like lithium ion batteries is still pretty high. For example, the newest Tesla Powerwall, one of the few small-scale batteries meant for residential energy storage, is priced at $7,600, not including thousands of dollars in installation costs. So while panels often generate excess power during the day, there's not always an efficient way to save that energy for later, and so customers often end up relying on non-renewable energy sources at night. Furthermore, permitting for rooftop solar takes time and money, and depending on where you live, installing solar on either a residential or commercial scale can still involve a large upfront cost, especially if your state or bank doesn't provide solar-friendly financing options. Solar installations require that to be permitted. Whether you can do it all remotely or whether you need a building inspector to come out to your home, all of those add costs, add time, add delays which all make the effective price if the policy environment is in favoring solar, often a real challenge to get large amounts of it deployed on the residential side. You'll also almost never see solar on apartments or office buildings because landlords just don't have a monetary incentive to install them for renters who pay their own electricity bills. As for single family detached homes, about 2% have solar. And while this actually represents a market improvement, it still means residential solar is a relatively rare site. But experts say it won't stay this way for long. 
in California, we have a mandate to have a million solar rooftops by the end of 2020. We've already met that goal. We're over a million rooftops now and still growing. Even if you haven't noticed the rise in solar roofs, visit the deserts or plains of California, North Carolina, or Arizona, and you'll see that a large percentage of new solar capacity comes from utility-scale plants producing hundreds of megawatts of electricity that feed into the grid. One such plant is the California Flats Solar Project, a 280-megawatt solar farm developed by First Solar and located in Monterey County, California. In 2018, utility-scale projects like this generated a total of 66.6 .6 million megawatt-hours of energy in the U.S. That's enough to power about 6.4 million homes for a year, and represents 69% of the country's total solar energy production. The large-scale solar projects can be anything from a 200-kilowatt system that you might see on the edge of a trailer park, or a 400-megawatt project in the desert. However, plants on the scale of Cal Flats are increasingly proving to be the most cost-effective size for utility-scale operation. When you get to 200 megawatts in size, you're able to take advantage of scale economies, so you can deliver a really cost-effective price of solar power. But when you start getting to larger sizes, sometimes it's difficult to find suitable land, to find suitable transmission capacity. So I think you'll see probably a larger number of mid-size utility-scale installations that are more strategically located closer to uh, the load where, where the power is being used. The rise of mid-size installations is also being driven by a growing corporate commitment to renewable energy. In 2018, corporations overall more than doubled the amount of clean energy they bought in 2017. In 2018, Facebook alone signed contracts for around 2.4 gigawatts of renewable energy, which is more solar energy than the entire residential solar market in the U.S. combined. This kind of corporate buy-in is ultimately necessary for a carbon-free future. About two-thirds of power is consumed by businesses. So even if everybody went renewable, if all houses went renewable, you'd still only get one-third of the way there. Cal Flats has a corporate partnership with Apple, which buys 130 megawatts of energy from the facility to power its California operations. The other 150 megawatts are sold to PG&E, which then combines this solar power with its other energy sources. Customers receive this blended power by default, but can opt into a program that allows them to receive more of their power from solar or other renewable energy sources. Many people live in cities or, or may not have access to a rooftop where they could install a solar system. So it's important that we have utility scale projects to help really create lots of opportunity for lots of different types of customers to be able to get solar power. However, these utility scale plants cannot achieve their full potential without energy storage. To compete with the reliability of fossil fuels, solar farms need to be able to generate energy on demand, not just when the sun is shining. When I've got um, systems out in the desert and, and a cloud goes overhead, we want enough of a shock absorber in the system in the form of batteries to help cover that power that's missing momentarily. It could be for a minute, it could be for four hours. Traditionally, storage has come in the form of lithium ion batteries. And luckily, the price for this tech is plummeting alongside the cost of solar panels. According to Bloomberg New Energy Finance, the average cost for lithium-ion batteries fell 85% from 2010 to 2018. Now, the average lithium-ion battery costs $176 per kilowatt hour. In some places, BB says solar plus storage has already won out. Today, in places like Hawaii and in California, solar plus storage, in, in most cases, is more cost-effective than a natural gas contract. In other words, those developers are winning bids solar plus storage versus natural gas. Solar power with storage is now often more economical than a type of power plant known as a peaker, which operates infrequently, only firing when demand is high. In April 2019, the utility company Southern California Edison opted for a solar plant with an 100 megawatt battery over a natural gas peaker plant in the coastal city of Oxnard. If regulators approve the plans, it would be tied with Tesla for the largest lithium ion battery in the world when it goes online in 2020. But unfortunately, lithium-ion may not be able to get that much cheaper. Many experts predict that costs will bottom out at around $70 to $100 per kilowatt hour. At this price, batteries will continue to be an economical option for replacing peaker plants and smoothing out hours-long gaps in solar production. But they won't be a good option for storing energy for weeks or months on end, 
as this would massively increase electricity costs for consumers. Some people think lithium ion is the ultimate and the path forward is to research heavily for um, improvements to lithium ion. Then there are others, and I count myself in the others camp, where I say lithium ion has done remarkable things for uh, technology, but let's go to something far better. So researchers like Sadaway are exploring new horizons. Now we're seeing flow batteries, which are liquid batteries. We're seeing high temperature nickel metal hydride batteries. And we're seeing other forms of storage that are not chemical or battery-based storage ramping up their use as well. For example, Bill Gates' investors fund, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, is backing the development of longer duration liquid batteries that would ideally be one-fifth the price of lithium ion. And researchers at Sandia National Labs are experimenting with molten salt thermal energy storage. This non-battery-based system uses concentrated sunlight to heat up molten salt, which is then stored in tanks for up to several days and later converted into steam to power a turbine. So that power production is the exact same as a coal-fired power plant, except instead of burning coal, we're using concentrated sunlight as our heat source. As for residential solar, the grid itself often acts as a battery. This is because most states have net metering policies that allow customers to sell their excess energy back to the grid in exchange for energy credits, which they can then use to power their home when the sun isn't shining. But whether storage comes in the form of cheaper lithium ion or newer experimental technologies, Cayman says that government policies and incentives will need to drive adoption, just like they did for solar panels themselves. Right now, the California utilities are operating under what's called the storage mandate. They are required by 2020 to have enough storage on board so that they can meet 2% of their peak demand. And we're negotiating right now with the state's Public Utilities Commission to increase that number. When we get to roughly 20% of our peak demand available in storage, we will be able to run a renewable-only system because the mix of solar and wind, geothermal, biomass, all backed up with storage, will be enough to carry us through even some of these potentially long lulls. In the meantime, expect to see solar installations continue to rise as prices fall and incentives and regulations spur development.